أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا ونبينا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma ja'al ma naquluhu wa naf'aluhu khalisan liwajhika al-kareem. Before I start with tonight's topic, I know you got used to that sentence, right? I'm not going to give a recap on what I talked about yesterday. There's no additions, inshaAllah. But I think that we should recite a salawat on behalf of all the brothers and sisters that are volunteering and helping and making these majalis as comfortable as possible for all of us. So please recite a salawat on their behalf. Also, I really like this backdrop behind me. So I think it deserves a salawat too. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The lesson I want to talk about tonight is the lesson of being aware of the godly omnipresence at all times and keeping up connection with him subhanahu wa ta'ala through prayer and remembrance. So we'll be talking about prayer and remembrance. Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, just like his grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, held on to prayer and remembrance at all times, from the very beginning of the revolution until the very end. Our problem with dua and prayer and remembrance is that we only do that in difficult times. When we face problems, we make dua. If we don't have any problems, we don't make any dua. Whereas we should make dua in each and every situation in our life. The narrations even say that we should ask for the salt of our food. You know you can find salt everywhere. But still the narrations tell us that you should make dua for the salt in your food. The problem about making or praying or reciting dua is that many of us can focus in dua. They zoom out. They listen the first two minutes, three minutes, and then they're just out of it. One reason could be that we don't live an Islamic lifestyle. What do I mean by that? If we lived an Islamic lifestyle, then we would have a different relationship with dua and prayer. But because we are not living an Islamic lifestyle, we don't feel the need to listen to dua or say dua or even dhikr. Let me give you an example, something I went through. Before I went to Hausa, I heard this narration. I'm sure most of you heard of it. It's related to Salat al-Layl. The narration says, Sheikh Saduq narrates it, in Amali Saduq. So the narrator is Al-An al-Mufaddal. He says, سَمِعْتُ مَوْلَايَ الصَّادِقْ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ يَقُولُ كان فيما ناجى الله عز وجل به موسى بن عمران عليه السلام أن قال له 
يا ابن عمران كذب من زعم أنه يحبني فإذا جنه الليل نام عني أليس كل محب يحب خلوة حبيبه؟ O son of Amran, he lied who claimed that he loved me, while in the middle of the night he slept heedless of me. Doesn't every lover crave to be alone and secluded with his loved, beloved? So when I heard that narration before I went to Hausa, I didn't understand the last part. What does he mean by Alaysa kullu muhibbin yuhibbu khalwata habibi? It made me think and I never really understood what is meant by, by this sentence. Why is Allah mentioning this point specifically? So after I went to Hawza, we would pray Salat al-Jama'ah every day. And all Salawat, we would pray them Salat al-Jama'ah. Duhur, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and even Fajr. So when I started praying Salat al-Jama'ah every day, after a while, I got the feeling that I want to pray on my own because when you pray Salat al-Jama'ah, you don't recite the Fatiha, you don't recite the Surah, even the Dua, you don't say it yourself, you just usually say the Dua that the Imam says in prayer. And you're not alone, you're with your brothers and sisters, you, you, don't, you don't feel this comfort like that you're alone speaking to Allah Azza wa Jal. So after a while praying Salat al-Jama'ah, I just wanted to pray on my own. I had the feeling, the need, that I need to pray. I want to recite the Fatiha. I want to recite, the, I want to pick the Surah. I want to do the Dua that I want to do. I want to say the Dua that I want to say. So I felt the need to pray alone. And then I remembered the narration. أَلَيْسَ كُلُّ مُحِبٍ يُحِبُّ خَلْوَةَ حَبِيبِهِ And then it made sense to me. Then it was clear to me. Oh, this is what Allah means. Because Allah Azza wa Jal wants us to pray Salat al-Jama'ah. If we were living an Islamic lifestyle, we would pray Salat al-Jama'ah all the time. So then, we would miss night prayer and praying alone and speaking alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because I never used to pray Jama'ah all the time, I would always pray alone. I would pray Fajr alone, Duhur alone, Asr alone, Maghrib alone, Asha alone. I didn't feel the need to pray Salat al-Layl. I didn't feel the need to be alone with Allah since I'm always alone with Him. But after I prayed Salat al-Jama'ah all the time, I wanted to pray, I wanted to speak to Allah my own way. يعني بكيفتي, براحتي. أو بكيفي? Maybe it's بكيفي, يمكن not بكيفتي. However, I just wanted to speak with Allah Azza wa Jal, so it made sense to me. Same thing with dua. Because we don't live an Islamic lifestyle, we don't feel the need to make dua as often and as much. And if we don't see a need in something, we won't do it. If I don't see a need in reciting dua, then I won't do it. So what I want to say is that sometimes we don't feel attached to the dua as much because we are not living an Islamic lifestyle. But if we lived an Islamic lifestyle, then we would sense the need of the dua and we would do dua. This, is, this could be one of the reasons. I want to give you a solution too. Sometimes, Dua Kumail, for example, is a bit long. It needs 20 minutes, 25 minutes. We have Dua Abi Hamza Thumali that is an hour long. Dua Arafah is quite long too. What you can do, what our scholars recommend, is that you don't have to read the whole Dua. And if it's either you, you listen to the whole dua, but you don't pay attention to the dua, or you just listen to the dua, a part of the dua, like five minutes from the dua, or you only read one page of the dua, then go for the second choice. But be aware of what you are actually saying and reciting. Don't just play the dua and sit and listen to it. So what we can do is just read a part of the dua, and then the next day we can read the second part and the third part and the fourth part. Aslan, one of our scholars says that we don't have the spirituality like the imams had to sit and read dua for one hour or two hours. But you can split them into many days and then each day you read a part from the dua. 
That could be a solution, but don't leave the dua completely. Listen to a part of the dua, and that will be inshallah enough. طيب صلوا على محمد وآل محمد. When we talk about dua and remembrance and prayer, we don't mean the remembrance of the tongue only. Because remembrance is more general. The highest form of remembrance and dhikr is the remembrance and dhikr of the heart. That you sense the presence of Allah, the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart. This is the highest form that you can reach. And if you reach this level, if you sense Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart, then you will live a happy life with tranquility. From here it is said that some students went to Sheikh Bahjat Qaddasallahu Nafsahu and they asked him for a book in Akhlaq. I don't know if they ask him to write a book in Akhlaq or if he recommends a book in Akhlaq. Regardless, يعني. They wanted a book in Akhlaq and he told them, you don't need a book in Akhlaq. Just know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. This is all that you need. And then he recited, Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara? Does he not know that Allah sees? This is all you need. If you are aware of this fact, then you don't need any book in Akhlaq. He's giving you the source, the origin of all good. Just know that Allah sees you and you won't have any problem in your life. If we reach the stage of dhikr and remembrance that Allah sees us, that he's aware of us, that he's watching us, then we don't need any book in Akhlaq. You don't need anyone to tell you these short mawa'ad and, uh, and ways of remembrance for you to remember Allah in the smaller ways. You have the origin. Allah sees you. Allah is watching you. You sense his presence in your heart, then alhamdulillah, you're good. This is what Sheikh Bahjad told them. And when we talk about prayer and dhikr and remembrance, they don't indicate weakness. Because people sometimes think that when you go to making dua and praying, that means you're weak. You don't have any other option. That's why you go and make dua. But dua and prayer don't indicate weakness. If they indicate something, then they're indicating a healthy relationship between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because remembrance and dua are not related to victory or defeat. That's why in Surah Al-Nasr, we read, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا When there comes God's victory and conquest or conquest, I don't know how it's pronounced, some of the brothers, I'm sure most of you realized, I don't have one accent. I say the same word once in British accent, American accent, my own accent. So as long as you understand what I'm trying to say, it's all right. So Allah says, when there comes God's victory and conquest, and you see the people entering God's religion in multitudes, then celebrate the praise of your Lord and seek his forgiveness. When the victory comes, seek his forgiveness. It's wrong to think that we only do dua, we only remember Allah Azza wa Jal when we're in difficult times, when we are losing, when we are weak. No, you remember Allah regardless if you're winning or if you're losing, if you're achieving victory or defeat. We always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the important thing is that while we are trying to fulfill our duty, we have to attach to it the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it will help us get through and fulfill our duty in the best possible way. And like I mentioned before, we don't have to worry about the result. The result is in Allah's hands. And I found something that I could share with you related to Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, but has nothing to do with, with Ismail this time. When Ibrahim alayhi salam finished the construction of the Kaaba and he built it and everything was done and set, Allah azza wa jal ordered him to call people to Hajj. But Nabi Ibrahim was alone in Mecca. The people weren't there, so he told him that even if I call out to Hajj, to people to come and perform Hajj, no one will listen to me. No one can hear me. Allah told him, don't worry. 
You just do your part, and I will deliver the message. I will forward your message. I will make sure that your message reaches the people. But you just do your part. You just do your duty. You just do your taklif, and I will take care of the rest. That's why it is said, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرًا يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ انت عليك أذن بالحج. I will do the rest. And proclaim, and proclaim among the men Hajj. They will come to you on foot and on every lean camel coming from every remote path. So you just do your part and I will do my part. This is what Allah Azza wa is basically saying. You just do what you have to do. طيب, if we look at remembrance and dhikr in Ashura, we can look at two things that took place. The first one is on the 10th of Muharram when Abu Thumam al-Sa'idi came to Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam and told him that he wants to pray the prayer, uh, Salat al-Duhr. Imam al-Husayn looked up to the sky and said, Indeed, هذا أول وقتها. This is the first, it's first time. هذا أول وقتها. Even during the battle and everything that was going on, Abu Thumama remembered prayer and salah, and he wanted to pray it. That's why Imam al-Husayn told him, ذَكَرْتَ الصَّلَاةِ جَعَلَكَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الذَّاكِرِينَ You remembered prayer, may you be amongst those of remembrance. This is one example. Another example that I want to talk about shway more in detail is in the night of the 10th of Muharram. The narration says that a man passed by the tents and he heard how Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and the companions were reading Quran and reciting dua and praying. What we have to look at internalize why are the companions and Imam al Hussein alayhi salam reading Quran and dua that night? What is it with the Quran? Because we have a narration. From Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, he says, if I had the Qur'an with me, I wouldn't feel any fear, even if the whole world left me, as long as I have the Qur'an with me. If you remember in the first night when we talked about the miracles and I said that we don't see the Qur'an as the greatest miracle, now I want to talk about the reality of the Qur'an. What is the Qur'an? Because once we understand what the Qur'an is, we will understand its greatness. One of the scholars says this about the reality of the Qur'an. He says, Al-Qur'an is kalamullah. Al-Qur'an is the word of Allah. Wa kalamullah min almillah. And the word of Allah is from the knowledge of Allah. Those who paid attention yesterday should by now know what I'm going to say. They should know what where I'm leading or going to. وَعَلْمُ اللَّهِ هُوَ ذَاتُ اللَّهِ And the knowledge of Allah is the existence of Allah because I said yesterday that His attributes are His own self. When I said His own that, by that I meant الذات الإلهية, not the English word that. So if the Qur'an is the word of Allah, and the word of Allah comes from the knowledge of Allah, and the knowledge of Allah is the existence of Allah. And I mentioned yesterday that Allah's existence is not limited. He is unlimited. That means his knowledge is unlimited. If his knowledge is unlimited, then his words are unlimited, then the Quran is unlimited. That's the, the, the haqiqah of the Quran. That's a, the reality of the Quran. That's why the scholars say that Regardless of how much tafsir and explanations we write on the Qur'an, we will never surround the Qur'an as in know its full meaning. That's why we have narrations that say, uh, we have a narration actually from Imam Ali alayhi salam, he, where he says, if I wanted to explain the Fatiha, I could explain it with so much paper and, and letters that not even 70 camels could carry the explanation of the Fatiha. Because the Fatiha is unlimited in its meaning. Its reality is unlimited. Because the Qur'an 
when we talk about the reality of the Quran, we're not talking about the words. The words are limited. Somebody could come and tell me, but the Quran is 600 pages. We're talking about the meaning of the Quran. The reality of the Quran is unlimited. Because the Quran is the word of Allah, which, is, which comes from the knowledge of Allah, which comes from the essence of Allah, and they're all unlimited. This is the reality of the Quran. This is the Ahlul Bayt have such a relation with the Quran. However, the Quran orders us to have dhikr and remembrance. يَقُولُ تَعَالَى يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ ذِكْرًا كَثِيرًا O oh, you who believe, remember Allah with much remembrance. I know in our time, the way we're living here in the West, sometimes we get too busy to have the stage of al-dhikr al-kathir. Because we have work, we have so many things to take care of. We don't find the time to practice al-dhikr al-kathir. But it's no problem because the, the verse continues. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَسَبِّحُوهُ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا And glorify him morning and evening. We have a lot of narrations that say at least do dhikr before the sun rises and before the sun sets. Do dhikr at these two times. It is recommended to do dhikr at these two times. And the best two forms and types of dhikr and remembrance are al-istighfar and as-salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. When it comes to istighfar, Sheikh Habib al-Kazimi says that al-istighfar cleans your soul just like how water cleans your body. Just like how you wash your body every day or every second day, your soul needs to be washed every day and every second day with istighfar. Because once you clean your soul, you can have a clean heart, a pure heart to recognize the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Referring to the first lecture. So this is one of the ways to purify and clean your heart. As salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad is the best type and the best form of remembrance. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Surely Allah and his angels bless the Prophet. O you who believe, call for divine blessings on him and salute him with the solution. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The problem is that we don't pay attention to the meaning of al-istighfar and as-salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We are just used to saying them sometimes without paying attention. So we use al-istighfar for bad things. So if my phone falls on the floor, I just be like, astaghfirullah. If I'm cooking and I burn the food, oh, astaghfirullah. If my friend is late, when ba'du astaghfirullah. But this is not what istighfar is for. And for good things, we use alhamdulillah or Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So if something good happens, oh, alhamdulillah. But we're not aware of this word, alhamdulillah. We just say it. In Lebanon, because we know we, we have electricity issues, kahraba comes and goes. So when kahraba goes, astaghfirullah. Kahraba comes back, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. This is what they use it for. But this is not why we should have dhikr and remembrance. It is good that we say these words. But they have a meaning that we should be aware of, that we have to internalize. For them to leave the needed impact and effect on us. Because once we are aware of the meaning of these words, they will have the needed impact on us and clean our hearts and pur purify them. Allah Azza wa Jal says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ You can't have a sound and clean and pure heart if it's not rested. So in order to have a sound and clean and pure heart, it needs to be rested. So you need to attach dhikr to it. 
هلا we welcome both youth organizations AIM and Al Haraka Al Husayniya with the salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Please repeat the salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And this is what we should learn from Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam from the event of Ashura. Because Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam would hold on to remembrance and dhikr and dua in each station. While I was praying, uh, preparing for Muharram, I came across an event that I thought is not known, but then it turned out to be a known event, but I just never paid attention to it. It, uh, the narration says the following On the 10th of Muharram After the companions All got killed And Imam al Hussein was left alone And during the last moments When the horse came back to the tents Abdullah ibn al-Imam al Hassan Came out to see what was going on. And he saw the horse, and Imam al Hussein was not on the horse. He was 11 years old. So he went to the battlefield to check up on Imam al Hussein. And he saw him on the ground. When he saw Imam al Hussein on the ground, he started crying. And then one of the enemies came closer to Imam al Hussein and he wanted to hit him. He wanted to strike him with his sword. So Abdullah, who was 11 years old, wanted to protect Imam al Hussein. So he put his hands forward. But the attacker didn't stop. And he cut off the hands of Abdullah. While Imam al Hussein was watching. But Imam al Hussein couldn't do anything. In this moment, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam turns to Allah. This is why I'm saying this story because he turns to Allah in remembrance and dua. Because ad dua is our weapon. Ad dua silahuna. He turns to Allah and says, Allahumma amsik anhum qatr al sama. O Allah, deny them the waters of the sky. In such a state, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam turns to Allah in remembrance. He remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he knows that we are from Allah and that we shall go back to him. He knows what it means that inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. He knows what it means la mu'athira fil wujudi illa Allah. No one can bear an impact on existence except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's living by these meanings. And that's why it is said that amongst his last words, he said, sabran ala qada'ik. Ya Rabbi, la ilaha siwak. O Allah, grant me patience on your divine decree. O Allah, there is no God but you. On the 8th of Muharram, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had rayat, he had flags. And he was passing them out to a few companions, but he left one flag. To himself. The other companions approached Imam al Hussein. They asked him, May I have this flag, please? Can you honor me with this flag? Can I have this flag? He said, This flag belongs to someone and he is coming. He is on his way. This flag was for Habib ibn Mudahir. Habib ibn Mudahir at that time, he was 90 years old. When he heard that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam needs help in Karbala, that he needs someone to help him and, and aid him, he went to Karbala. When he arrived, he went down from his horse and he said, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein went to him and gave him his flag. The companions, when they knew that Habib has arrived, they went out and greeted Habib. Sayyidah Zainab salam in her tent heard the noise outside. She called Ali al-Akbar. She asked him, what is going on outside? What is happening outside? Who came to look after the stranger of Karbala? 
He told her, Amma, it's Habib. Habib arrived in Karbala. She said, Please send my salams to Habib. Ablig Habib anni salam. Ali al Akbar went to Habib and he told him, Ya Am, Ammati Zainab tukri'u kas salam. When he heard these words, he went on the floor. He started crying and he took the sand from the floor and put it on his head. He said, Who am I? Who am I to deserve to be greeted by Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam? He said, Man anna wa man akoon hatta tusallim alayya bintu amir al mu'mineen. He then looked at Imam al Hussein and asked him for permission to go and send his salams on Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. Imam al Hussein gave him permission. He went to the tent. He stood by, by the tent and said, Assalamu alaykum ya ahla bayt al nubuwa wa mawdi al risala wa mukhtalaf al malaika. Assalamu alayk ya Zainab. Zainab then replied, Wa alayk assalam ya am ya habib. Ya am. أوصيك بهذا الغريب خيرا لا تقصر عن نصرة الحسين أنت حبيب ما قصر عن نصرة الحسين عليه السلام and the companions of Imam al-Hussein ما قصروا عن نصرة الحسين عليه السلام